Hi, I'm Zeke with the Eastside Church of Christ in Baytown, Texas. Thanks for joining us today. I'm glad you did. We're going to be talking about the church today, and I'm going to invite you to turn your Bible with me to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to begin reading right away. The passage on the slide says, verses 22 through 23, but we're going to read beginning in verse 18. Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 18. Let's read together. Paul writes to not only the church that met in Ephesus, but also by extension to us today. And there are a lot of good things in it that we can that we can learn. Paul says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let me ask you a question. What's right with the church? Well, quite a bit. We'll see in a moment, just as we'll talk a little bit more about what we just read. But usually that's not the question that folks ask, right? What folks generally see is what's wrong with the church. They see deficiencies and shortcomings and mistakes, and they're quick to point those out as things that are wrong with the church. And of course, after all, if we're focused on fault finding, then we'll have no trouble finding those faults. But Ephesians 1, especially in verses 22 and 23, tells us in a nutshell that there's a lot right about the church simply because it belongs to Jesus. In fact, in verse 23, it tells us that, that Jesus is the fullness of Him, God, who fills all in all. So, since He's the fullness of God, well, as the head of the church... Our fullness is in Him, right? Sometimes when people are asking about what kind of a church they should look for, we usually tell them that, that they should look for the right church. But what makes a church the right church? Is it simply a, a, a sign on the building that designates a, a, a certain kind of people? Maybe that's part of it. But a church I'm going to submit to you is the right church if it's got the right stuff. So what's the right stuff? I think at the very beginning of the right stuff for the right church is the foundation upon which it's built. Everything has got to have a proper foundation. And that's not hard to understand. We get that with a building. A building's got to be, got to be supported if it's going to be able to, to support the whole structure. A marriage has got to have a good foundation, or else like a deck of cards, that relationship is just going to fall apart. And it's the same with the church. So we should recognize that the church is built on the right, on the right foundation. It's built on stability. In Ephesians chapter 2, and in verse, we're going to begin in verse 19. In Ephesians 2 and in verse 19, the Apostle Paul says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Now, we're going to stop right there just to make a point. When Paul speaks of God's household or the family of God, he's talking about the church. He's talking about those people who have come together to worship and devote themselves to God. And he says in verse 20 that they've been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. There's a lot of language in here where Paul tells us that we are being built into something. We are being fitted together like stones and blocks, being, being put together to, to form this beautiful edifice, this, this structure, this, this building. And he says it's built on something very stable. He tells us in verse 20 that it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, the apostles 
understood the importance of faith in Jesus. In fact, it's what they established as the first step in salvation. They told people, believe in Jesus, not just that he was a man who really lived, he was from Nazareth and he did good things, but that he's the Messiah, he's the Christ, he's, he's the Lord, he's the Son of God. Believe not just that he is, but who he is. And we see in verse 20, that Jesus himself is the cornerstone. It's, it's the, 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 the one stone that determines how we build out and how we build up. And although we're piling on the foundation that the apostles themselves laid down, it's really Jesus who determines how that building goes because he's that solid cornerstone. He's the solid rock. Back in Matthew chapter 16, I love this passage. In Matthew 16, Jesus is asking a question about who people think he is. He wants to drive a point home to his disciples. After all, they're going to be the ones carrying the important message of salvation to the world. And in Matthew 16 and in verse 13, it says that when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others Elijah, but still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. There's, there was a lot of confusion back then about this Son of Man. Who is it that we should be expecting? What's he going to look like? What's he going to do? And so Jesus becomes more pointed. He says in verse 15, But who do you say that I am? And in one of those beautiful but rare shining moments, Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Jesus is telling Peter that there is going to be something stable, sure, and secure upon which he's going to build his assembly, his church, the people who will be called by his name. And it's going to start with faith in him. That wonderful statement that Peter made, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the same statement of belief that even still today, people make when they come to submit themselves to Jesus' authority in baptism. That's the right foundation. But, there's more. The right church should also have the right faith. And by faith, I'm talking about the faith. The system of salvation that not only establishes how one is saved, but also how one stays saved. And by the faith, we find it referred to that way a lot in the New Testament. Just a few places in the book of Acts tells us that. In Acts 6 verse 7, it tells us about how the word of God kept on spreading and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, becoming obedient to the faith. In Acts 14 verse 22, Paul and his companions were strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. In Acts 16 and verse 5, it says that the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. And so we see this term, the faith, being used in three ways. One, it's that which, which brings you to belief in Jesus. It's that which you have to continue to maintain in order to maintain your salvation. And finally, it's that what the church uses to, to keep itself strong, to grow on, to thrive in. That's important for us. The faith is the doctrine, simply the teaching that comes from God's revealed will. Because without it, think about it, if God hadn't revealed the faith to us, how would we know whether we're right with him or not? But he has revealed it to us. And therefore, it's up to us to make sure that we are keeping in the faith. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and in verse 5, Paul says simply to test yourselves, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. And we've got to do that, not just individually, but also as churches. We've got to make sure that we understand that a truth 
teaching church is going to affirm the Word of God. And as it affirms the Word of God, it's also going to fulfill its God-given work. And part of that God-given work is God-given work is not only reaching out to those who were unsaved, but also reaching in to those who are saved to make sure that even as we reach out to people to believe in the message of the gospel, the faith, the same faith helps us to maintain our own salvation. So the church, the right church, has a right foundation, the right faith, and because it's got the right faith, it maintains the right fellowship. Fellowship, I believe, is the lifeblood of the church. But it's more than mere association. We should understand that. We should understand especially how the Bible uses this word for fellowship. It uses it in the sense that it's work that we participate in together. And it uses it in a special kind of way. In the New Testament, the word fellowship is used as a noun, not a verb. It is a state in which we are in, not action that we perform, although the state of fellowship moves us to perform acts of fellowship. But I want us to realize that the basis of our fellowship begins with our state in Christ. That's what John talks about in 1 John chapter 1. Let's turn there together, 1 John chapter 1. In 1 John 1, Paul says, or rather John says in verse 3, what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. See, I want you to notice something there. He didn't say so that you may do fellowship with us, but he says that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that your joy may be made complete. Well, how is it that we have that fellowship? How do we how do we reach that state of fellowship? He tells us in verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. So there's the key for us. This The basis of our fellowship is our relationship with Jesus because of our cleansed souls, because of the forgiveness of our sins, and because of our continual walking in the light of God's Word. And just as we understand that the basis of our fellowship produces us something that we share in together, it means that this fellowship is a, a partnership. That's exactly how Paul refers to it. In Philippians chapter 1, let's go there together. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul talks about this this fellowship that that he enjoyed with the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1, in verse 5, actually let's begin in verse 3. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. I want you to notice something. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. And in verse 5, I refer to a word called participation. Well, that's the same word that was translated fellowship over in 1 John chapter 1, in verse 3, and in verses 6 and following. He says, this fellowship actually is an opportunity for us to participate together in the gospel. Because it is not only a partnership in our work, it comes from our partnership with Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's go there together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul talks about how this is brought out beautifully in our sharing together of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and in verse 16, Paul asks, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing? There's our word, fellowship, participation, a sharing in the blood of Christ. Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. There's a lot of wonderful lessons we can learn here, of course, of, of unity, of togetherness, 
of having one faith, one mind together. But I don't want us to miss the important concept of the fact that all of this comes about because we have fellowship with Jesus. That's the basis and the partnership of our fellowship. So the right church has not only got the right foundation, it's working with the right faith. It's also got the right fellowship. And because it's got the right fellowship and it works with the right faith, it'll have the right focus. Now, I don't know how big your local church is. And it doesn't matter how big any local church is. It's probably not 100% of the people who live in that town. And I'm sure that we could probably pack in a whole lot more people if we catered to a a worldly mindset, if we had concerts or entertainment or food, fun, frolic. All that stuff would certainly bring in the masses. One wise older man that I knew said, if you draw them in with hamburger, though, then you're going to have to feed them steak to keep them. And that's true. It's true not only physically, but it's also true spiritually. But there's a great point here. Our focus is not physical. Our focus is spiritual because the soul is of infinite value. Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 26, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That's a good question. What can possibly take the place of the essence of you, who you are? One writer said, you don't have a soul, you are a soul. You have a body. This vehicle that you and I carry through life, our bodies, is one day going to be laid in the ground. But our soul, our soul will continue. And it's that soul that Jesus gave himself for. In Matthew chapter 9, I'm going to make a left to Matthew chapter 9. Notice something with me. In Matthew 9, Jesus looks around him and he sees the immense need of those whom he came to help. In Matthew 9, I'm going to begin in verse 35. It says that Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. I'm going to stop there for a moment, just ask you, is that why Jesus came? So that we wouldn't be sick anymore? If that were so, all Jesus had to do is simply speak, and disease and sickness would forever be eradicated. I believe that Jesus healed people because he wanted to point them to a much larger need, a deeper healing that they needed. In fact, if we continue reading in Matthew 9, verse 36 says that seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. No, Jesus came not to heal the body, but to heal the soul. See, too often we focus on our wants, our physical wants, while our spiritual needs go unaddressed. But we all have the same basic spiritual need. Somebody said this way. They said, if our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So he sent us a Savior. Because your soul is valuable. And so the church's focus is on the soul. At the Eastside Church of Christ, where I labor in Baytown, Texas, that's all we're about. We are completely immersed in the Word of God because we know that the faith is all that can save us and keep us saved. That faith tells us about Jesus It tells us about God's great love for us. It tells us about the plan for our salvation that had been in God's mind since the beginning of time and how he was going to use his son to implement that plan. It tells us about the glorious, right future of the church. So here's the question. 
Where will you spend your eternity? That's the million dollar question. We know one thing, and we've seen it over and over again. It's that death is certain, but also judgment is sure. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, as Paul wrote to the Corinthians there, he told them some sobering news. In 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says that everybody is going to face the same situation. In verse 10, he says that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that everyone may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So when Paul says that everyone is going to go through judgment, it's not just the bad people. It's, it's everybody. He's speaking to Christians, and he says we must appear there also. So death is just as sure as judgment is coming to all of us. But just as death and judgment are sure, so also is resurrection for everybody. Just as everyone will die and be judged, so all will be resurrected. But the big question is to what? In John chapter 5, let's go there. Jesus has something to say about that. John chapter 5, we're going to begin in verse 25. In John 5 and in verse 25, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. I want you to just focus for a moment on what Jesus says in verse 25. He says, An hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. I believe Jesus is talking about the resurrection, the rising to new life that Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, where he says that upon baptism, we die to sin and become alive to Christ. We are risen to walk in newness of life, Paul puts it there in Romans 6. I think that's what Jesus is talking about here. That in this life, there is a resurrection of sorts. And it's a precursor to a later, final resurrection. Let's keep reading. Verse 28. Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, in which all who were in the tombs will hear his voice, and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of life of judgment. Now before Jesus says uh, an hour is coming and now is, he says, well, there's an hour that's coming. It's not here yet, but there is an hour is com uh, coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Can you imagine a voice so resonating that even the dead hear it and respond? The call of that voice is going to raise people from their graves. And he says, that some will be raised to life, while others will be raised to judgment. And by judgment there, Jesus means condemnation. So I want you to think about this for a moment. We're all going to live somewhere. The question is, where? We're all going to live forever somewhere. So where will we spend our eternity? The church of Jesus Christ. The church with the right foundation, the right faith, the right fellowship, the right focus, have the right future. And it's reaffirmed to us in Revelation chapter 21. Let's go all the way to the end of the book. Revelation chapter 21. Look with me, if you will, in the first few verses. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 1. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. 
and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. What a wonderful, wonderful future that those who were in the right church have to look forward to. In fact, the right church is so right, it cannot be wrong because it's got the right stuff. Now, I want us to realize it doesn't mean that its members are flawless. I mean, after all, that right church is simply made up of flawed human beings. But we're flawed human beings who have a flawless Savior. And because, as we read in Ephesians chapter 1, that He is the fullness of God, He is our fullness as well. And in Him, and only in Him, have we got the right stuff. I hope you'll consider some of the things that we've said today. And if you're looking for a church of which you want to find the right stuff, well, I hope you'll let us help you. Thanks for listening. God bless you.